Hello everybody and welcome to this new series on what to do in the first five minutes with an English literature anthology poetry question. Let's imagine your named poem is Ozymandias and this is the question. Compare how poets present ideas about power in Shelley's Ozymandias and one other poem. OK, so the first thing to do is reread or scan through the named poem, pen in hand, and to annotate anything you can think of that might be relevant to the question. So for Ozymandias, you might pick out that the poem is a sonnet. A sonnet is a form of love poetry which originated in 13th century Italy but is best known with reference to the 14th century poet Petrarch. A Petrarchan sonnet follows the conventions seen here on the left. In the 16th century, we have the emergence of what would become known as the Shakespearean sonnet, which follows the convention seen here on the right. Ozymandias, then, is definitely a sonnet, and in simple terms, we can say that Shelley uses the sonnet form to highlight how Ozymandias is in love with himself, in love with his delusional sense of power and supremacy. But when we look closely at the poem, we see that it does not fit neatly into either of these sonnet forms. Many see elements of the Petrarchan sonnet in Ozymandias. There are 14 lines, structured as a group of eight lines, the octave, which presents details about the broken statue, and a group of six lines, the sestet, which focus on the pedestal and its now ironic message of complete power. However, the opening rhyme scheme, ABAB, fits the Shakespearean sonnet model, not the Petrarchan model. And then we have the continuing rhyme scheme, A, C, D, C, E, D, E, F, E, F, which doesn't follow either sonnet form. So whether you would choose to say the sonnet moves from a Petrarchan to a Shakespearean to a new form of sonnet, or would simply summarise and say that the poem is a sonnet, but one which is continually adapting and changing, lacking consistency, with the initial rhyme scheme being placed with something new, the question is what does this tell us about power and I think we can say that power is transitory it doesn't last forever it changes over time and in the poem the rhyme scheme is transitory it changes over time as the poem progresses and here we see form reflecting content to represent how human power despite those who own it feeling invincible is open to change we might also pick out the religious language King of Kings, Ozymandias' self-appointed title on the pedestal links to the Bible in 1 Timothy 6.15 the title King of Kings is given to God. So what can we say about this? Well, firstly that Ozymandias sees himself as godlike in his power. Notice the hard alliterative k sound there. We see it again in cold command. Poets often use the k sound to create an aggressive, harsh tone. And here we can say this alliteration indicates the cruelty of Ozymandias. He was a powerful ruler who is presented as aggressive and oppressive. So that rereading of the named poem will give me my concept. Ozymandias presents someone who thinks they are all powerful. And here I'll reference the sonnet form, religious language and hard consonant sounds, but shows how that sense of power is an illusion, it will not last, where I'll reference the changing nature of the sonnet form. Now with that in mind, I will then flick back to the list of poems and browse through each title one by one, considering which poem to compare with that line of argument. Now, just to make this clear, you don't have the poems with you, but you do have a list of the titles. So looking through the titles is a good way of thinking, does this poem compare well? Does this one? Etc, etc. And let me just point out, it's not that I will now think, OK, is there another poem that uses the sonnet form or religious language or hard consonant sounds? No, what I want to do is think about my second poem in terms of ideas, that any sense of power is ultimately an illusion. The June 2019 exam report pointed out that students who led their analysis through ideas in the poem rather than methods tended to do much better. So that's why I want to follow this approach. Now, there are some poems which definitely present ideas about power, but in a way which won't fit neatly into my line of argument. For example, Kamikaze looks at the power of nature, as does Extract from the Prelude, and even though it's possible to look at Ozymandias as being about the power of nature, that's not what I've picked out when rereading the poem. So go through the list and think which compares well, and you might want to pause the video now and have a go at that. And I think my best bet will be My Last Duchess, where the Duke has a sense of power, reflected through the use of the dramatic monologue form, where he's the only one speaking and the listener remains silent throughout. But that sense of power is undermined through the fact that the poem is one long stanza filled with enjambment. It's as if the Duke can't control what he's saying. He's just blurting out all this information. 
Now, obviously, I don't have My Last Duchess in front of me, so I'm going to need to remember quotations and references, but this now is my concept. Both Ozymandias and My Last Duchess present speakers who believe they are powerful, but ultimately the reader learns this sense of power is an illusion. Now, this is a two-part line of argument, and I'm going to spend perhaps the first half of my answer looking at the sense of power, and the second half looking at how it's an illusion. Everything in my answer then becomes part of the theory I'm exploring. Now, of course, I'm not saying this is how you would have to do it if a question came up about Ozymandias and power. All I'm trying to do is show you the sort of process you might go through for that first five minutes. If you have a different idea for a poem you would choose to compare in this question, that's fine. Why not post about it in the comments section? If you found this video useful, please do give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel.